الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا دخلوا في السلم كافة ولا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله we had a session and we had a few weeks in the last few weeks regarding the ideologies and the solutions the Quran provides us for the LGBT issues and especially how we understand it in the in the light of the Quran and just continuing on inshallah the next four weeks or so we will be actually speaking about what the Quran says regarding the gender interactions and mixing of the genders. And we'll get into why this is so important, um, but it's very related to what we're speaking or we have been speaking about in the past. See, everything in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is connected. It has a relationship where one thing touches upon another thing will, which it will touch upon something else. And so we see, for example, when a person's society at a societal level, there are flaws, there are issues. Those issues and those flaws come about in the individual and their lives. And that's something widespread, well-known. And this is the nidam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every single section of our life has been detailed in the Quran. And I always say this, that we just have to pick up the Quran and see what it says. We see all the solutions are there, but what time and what effort do we put in to actually see what are those solutions and how is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing us with those answers. So inshallah what we'll be doing is the first uh, week inshallah today we'll be speaking about interactions and intermixing and what it means in Islam. We'll then be speaking next week about the verses that have to do with uh, interaction and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how he shows those lessons to us and then the third week will be the intermixing and as far as the masjid there's a lot of questions regarding the partition um, how it's supposed to be what is the prophetic way of having parda and things like that and ultimately also we'll speak about what the Quran offers as solutions uh, regarding interactions not only in the physical sense but also we can say online now uh, with text messaging and chatting and different avenues. With that being said, inshallah, uh, we want to also make sure that everybody understands what is the purpose of these sessions. So when we look at the tafsir of the Quran, tafsir means the explanation of the Quran. There's many things in tafsir. But what we want to do is understand the lessons that the Quran is mentioning regarding a certain topic. So in our example, what is the Quran saying as far as interaction between a man and a woman? And how do we understand that with our world and our context around us? So when we talk about interaction and gender interaction, we are referring to how opposite genders communicate with each other and deal with each other in different situations. This is very important because as we'll go on, probably the next week we'll mention this is in certain cases and certain times, there is a lot more leeway between what a person, a man can interact with a woman. And in certain cases, for example, let's say it's a closed room, it's a private room in a private space, there's very less interaction that is permissible between the man and a woman. So it has to do with a lot of the way that we communicate and the way we deal with each other. We understand a lot of, for example, how our society also functions and how they interact and where are they getting their roots and their expectations from. These interactions and these things are actually from not only the, the culture of the people, but also the society and enlarge the religion. And we know America and the Western world, they don't follow a religion. It's a secular world, it's an atheist world. And so what do they follow? Humanism where they think that whatever is in their sight, in their eyes, correct, that is something that is acceptable. And in their sight, in their logic, in their reasoning wrong, that is not acceptable. There's a big difference between Muslims 
and others in this regard. We get our norms. Majority of our norms are from the religion of Islam. And then society and culture has an added value. So main of it, the actual crux of it is Islam. And I'll give you a few examples. Let's say, for example, you know, in many of our cultures, we invite each other. And when we invite each other, how are we, how are we hosting the person? What are the things that we do to host that individual to make sure that they are comfortable? They're at ease. Nobody's going to be rude or mean to a guest. Giving them a space, offering them food, offering them dessert and you know, so on and so forth. This is just one example. This is actually the Islamic teachings that have been around in our cultures and our regions so long that it became part of our cultures. We don't attribute it to culture uh, Islam, but it actually has the roots from Islam. Right? We see the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses upon the hospitality of Sahaba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they prefer each other even though they have very uh, less and they, they're very poor. They have few things, but they preferred each other. They turned off the lights, they acted as if they had food to eat, but it was actually rocks in a bowl. And from that, they were actually sacrificing their hunger, their thirst, so that their guests are taken care of. So the roots of it is from Islam. And this is the biggest uh, uh, idea that we have to understand. In our norms, in our, you know, what we say, the gender roles, Islam has a huge role of what it is. And then after that is culture and society. Sometimes that overpowers, you know, sometimes it's the other way where culture is now added into a person's life and the person is doing things, they think it's religious, but it has no religion to it. For example, widows, in some cultures, it's a taboo and it's unknown for them to get married, remarried. Once they become a widow, they're expected to live their life out as a widow. But the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches that a person that has become a widow, they can remarry. After their waiting period, after their iddat is done, they can remarry. There is nothing wrong with that. So we have to have that balance where the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the way that we are getting our uh, norms and our understanding. And then after that is culture and society. Another example uh, that I wanted to mention was the fact that the roles that we have in our genders, right? Society now is pushing for us to say and uh, think that there are no roles between a man or difference between uh, the roles of a man and the roles of a woman. And I mentioned this you know, a few weeks ago that we see in our culture and through the history in the 1900s, there was a change in the roles of man and woman. Before the women were not going out and being so uh, liberal, free thinking, and even voting was an issue a lot of issues in the 1900s. And then we see a change in the way that the roles of a man was and the roles of a woman. And we saw the collapse, almost the collapse of the family structure, where now the children, they were not being brought in the same principles and the same manners as the mother and father. Rather, it was you know uh, the, the government and the schools and things like that. Islam teaches us that they are equality in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever a person a man can achieve a woman can also achieve and whatever a woman and the status and the reward a woman can achieve also a man can achieve but at the same time we also have different roles and we have different responsibilities and these roles and responsibilities also play a, a the high role in how we interact with each other right for example in the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we often see that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba, they were in expeditions, they were in business uh, uh, um, journeys, they were in routes, and there would be days, if not weeks, months, that they would not see their families. And at the same time, the, the Sahabiyat, the Ummul Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers, they were involved in taking care of and upbringing and giving tarbiyat to the children. 
So they're getting the same reward as jihad and fighting in the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while they're sitting at Medina. So this is the this is the equivalency Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. In one hadith, it mentions that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Ya Rasulullah, the, the men, they can go for jihad. They can go for expeditions. They can go for fighting. What do the women have? And so he, he answered that they have hajj. Hajj is their expedition. They're going out. And their experience of hardship, obstacles, and everything else. But at the same time, them doing what they're doing currently, they will get the same exact reward as the men that are going out and fighting. So Islam has a beautiful way. And actually, uh, you know, it's a separate topic on its own, but also the rights that Islam has provided for the women, that they're not traded, they're not bartered like they were in Europe. They're not individuals that were uh, almost... Uh, you know, uh, property. Rather, they were they could own property. They could have their own wealth. They can have their own rights. They can have their own uh, um, you know uh, restrictions. So all of these things Islam has provided for them. Now, there's many places in the Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala shows us the interaction between the genders. And inshallah, we'll be going in a deeper. Uh, deeper understanding of these verses next week but just to bring in the importance of what we're speaking about many times actually i'm not going to say many times almost 99 percent there is a very lack of understanding what is ikhtilat what is intermixing what is interactions between men and women there's one side for example one side will be so uh, uh conservative in their definition of what is interaction what they will do is they will see some sister coming from one side and they'll, they'll almost see, you know, duck and cover, like cover themselves and hide. And similarly, the, the sisters, they'll do the same thing. And then there's the other side where they're completely nonchalant, acting as if there's nothing that you have to be aware of, nothing that you have to be, uh, uh, you know, stop yourself from. They're mixing, they're joking, they're, you know, speaking to each other. There has to be the correct definition of what is interaction, what is mixing, and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in those uh, rules. We see that, the, for example, the section of where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the angels to Ibrahim alayhi salam and his wife. In the verses, it mentions that his wife, she heard what the angels said, and they came in the form of a man, and she laughed. So what does this interaction show us about how we're supposed to bring in gender interactions in our life? Another is the story of Musa alayhi salam and the daughters of Shu'aib. There's a, almost, I would say, two pages in the Quran, two rukus, that mention how Musa alayhi salam interacted with them. Just on that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought that, that every single time me and you read these verses, we're getting a reward to reenact and recount what happened with Musa alayhi salam. And it's interesting. He sat down, he went and gave them the, their uh, flock water, came back, and then they came, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the way she walked and how he acted and how they got... Everything is being described for a reason. Again, it's all in the Quran. We have to look at those lessons. Uh, there is almost, I would say, entire surah, surah Nur, dedicated for societal norms. Societal norms are those things that are accepted in a society, again, based off a person's religion, based off a person's culture and society. And entire surah Nur mentions what are the Islamic norms that we should have as a society. There's many places, inshallah, we'll be looking into those verses also. And then also we'll be looking into the verses of surah Yusuf, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the interaction between Yusuf alayhi salam, the wife of the Aziz, and what interactions and what lessons we can take from that. One last thing to mention on this is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so many evidences, he has also given us the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam to show and provide what are the benefits, how do we implement the sunnah and the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a practical sense. So we'll be also looking at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa regarding this. And in a large, we'll see exactly what is Islam saying about gender interactions. 
Now let's speak about the the importance of having proper con conduct interaction in our society. We know that interactions they have a direct impact in our society, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala the way He has made insan, there is dhakar and unfa, there is man and then there is woman, and they're not in the sense that they're not similar, but they're in need of each other. You cannot have a family. You cannot have a generation. You can't carry on knowledge and ilm without having a male and a female, regardless of what society is saying. Right. So this is something that we have to understand. If there is that interaction, and there is that attraction, then of course Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants that in the the dini and the Islamic sense. Now, one other thing we see is that all of these limits and these limitations must be understood in a holistic manner. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's telling us in so many verses what the interaction should be, how important is it. But they must be understood in a complete sense. Now I'll give you an example. Everybody knows that it's not permissible for a man, a young man to touch a female. But now let's say it's a life-saving event. And you have to save their life. Of course, then the rulings and the thing that you're supposed to do, the hukum that you're supposed to do is save their life. Similarly, there is doctors, there is uh, medical issues. All of these things, whenever there is a need, whenever, whenever there is a durura, there will be consideration for that need. And a person is permit, permitted to save lives, use it for medical interaction and things like that. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in the Qur'an, and this is the first passage, inshallah, that we'll be looking at, that mentions ikhtilat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us what's, what is ikhtilat. Ikhtilat is actually, the translation of it is mixing, intermixing. For example, in wudu, we say, when you have to uh, make wudu and you have to go through your beard, we say khilal. Khilal is going through your beard, going through your hands. And what is it? You're interweaving your fingers, you're in going through your beard. Another place is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the Quran, Al Akhillau Yoma ibn Ba'aduhum li Ba'adin Adu. The close friends on the day of judgment, they will be enemy to each other. They thought in this life that they're living a very nice life, they're uh, helping each other in sins and different things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those close friends, they will be enemies to each other. Why? Because they deviated each other, they misguided each other. And the word he uses is akhilla, which is from khalil. Another place, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Al-mar'u ala dini khalilihi. That a person is upon the path and religion of his best friend. And again, the word khalil is used. Ibrahim al-khalil. Again, the word khilal is, uh, khalil is used. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in, in one, one of the places in the Quran, the word ikhtilat. And he says that this is speaking about the, the people when they came to test Dawud al Islam about their cattle. And Dawud al Islam had made an oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will uh, uh, dedicate himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, قَالَ لَقَدْ ظَلَمَكَ بِسُؤَالِ نَعَجَتِكَ إِلَىٰ نِعَاجِهِ وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ الْخُلَطَاءِ لَيَبْغِي بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَالِحَاتِ وَقَلِيلٌ مَّا هُمْ So he said that he has wronged you by asking you about your cattle to add to his cattle. Truly many partners are unjust to each other. So this shows us that ikhtilat is speaking about when a person is in a close contact, in a free mixing where they're closely around each other. And if we want to, again, the correct understanding we will see uh, next week when we look in the verses and the ayat. But if we want to understand this, interaction is a broader topic. Intermixing is more uh, uh, fine than that. Intermixing means that the opposite genders are mixing with each other in a gathering maybe together, speaking, physical contact, and as we see the verses and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, we'll see what is permissible in this and what is not permissible.
So this is just in a general sense, what does ikhtilat, when we say the word ikhtilat, intermixing, mixing, what does that mean? This is what it means. But we will see exactly what it means as we see in the verses um, coming, inshallah. In another place, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he mentions to us, you know, and I brought these verse, uh, these ahadith for a reason. Many times there is an objection. Why do we have to change the way that we are uh, dealing with each other? Shouldn't it be that, you know, a person just goes on having a good notion of everybody continuing their life, doing what it's supposed to do without worrying about ikhtilat, without worrying about mixing, without worrying about this is the men's space, this is the women's space, and this and that. And now there's a new fitna that let's forget about house and the masjid, let's open a third space. And that third space will be everybody can just come together. So the Prophet sallallahu this is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that is mutafaq alayhi. That means it is uh, uh, narrated in both Bukhari and it's also narrated in uh, Muslim. And this is mentioning about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa warning on ikhtilat. And he mentions, قَالَ مَا تَرَكْتُ بَعْدِي فِتْنَةً هِيَ أَضَرُّ عَلَى الرَّجُلِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ He said, I have not left any fitna after me that is more harmful to the men than women. And this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Remember, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was a person that was completely balanced. He was our spiritual father. He was the one that revelation was descended upon him and he had to explain that revelation. What is he saying? He's saying, I don't fear upon the men anything, any more harmful issue, any more harmful fitna than women. It shows us the fact that a person must be, you know, at least to a certain level, they must be careful, cautious on what and how they're interacting with the other genders. We can't make this, uh, uh, you know, sorry claim that, you know, in America, we're working with each other. We're going to the grocery stores. We're, you know, going everywhere. And there's no, uh, there is no uh, uh, segregation. It's not like a women's uh, safe way and a men's safe way. It's all together. So why do we have to worry about this? Why should this be an issue? It has to be worried about. It has to be an issue. It has to be in our minds. It has to be dealt with so that we don't fall into this fitna that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, again, this on the importance of what it means to uh, have ikhtilat, what it means that a person is mixing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Quran, Zuyina linnasi hubbu shahawati minan nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our life, he tests us with various, various things. Many times, the test is not something that we see. It's something that we feel. We experience it. We know that this is a test because we don't know what to do. We don't know how to react. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the test. Imagine you had to study for an exam, but you didn't know what's on the exam. That's going to be hard, right? Now imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us what is going to be on the test. What is the questions? What are the things that we should watch out for? How do we make sure to save ourselves? And then we're not really paying attention to these verses. We're, not, we're just looking at it and we're saying, you know, that was for the people before. This is something for the Islam of the backwards. No, this is, Islam is eternal. Islam is for everybody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning, this is the exam. We have beautified these desires and temptations. Who's these temptations and these desires for? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a few, uh, a few categories. The first and foremost, from women. We have to understand this, this dunya, what we hear in this world, all of it is a test. A woman in, it, in their physique, in their physical, they are a temptation for the men. A man is not the same temptation for a woman. But we have to understand each person has a different way of psychology, a difference, a difference in biology. So their, their way of thinking, their way of interaction, different things will actually make the other person desirous. For example, for a man, the physical is desirous. They see something and they will get uh, uh, tempted. For a woman, it may not be something that is physical. Rather, it may be something emotional where they see and hear and talk and 
and, you know, speak to somebody and then they get, you know, uh, tempted. So we have to understand these are two different genders, two different ways of attraction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's why he's saying, Zuyuna linnasi hubbu shahawati minan nisa. We have beautified and we have uh, made uh, into something of zina, the love of desires from women. Number two, he says, wal banin. And then number two, he says, children. How are children coming into existence? Children again, goes back to women. That's why brothers and sisters, this issue of ikhtilat, this issue of intermixing is something that we have to understand. Years go on, people don't even understand this. And then time after time, they're in sin. And then when someone does tell them after 40 years or 50 years of their life, they act as if this was something completely unheard of. No, it's right here in the Quran. You know, look at the book, read the book, look at the verses. It's not, if anybody has a doubt, this is Surah Ali Imran verse 14. It's right here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, this is what it is. If we take the heed, we're going to be successful. There's no point in coming and learning and listening and listening. We have to see what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying something, we need to understand He's our creator. We're the creation. We're not the creator. He's our creator. We're the creation. He is the one that we submit to. We're not the ones that everybody needs to submit to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have you seen the one that has taken their desires as a God? That their desires, their will, and the, what they want is what is holy. Other than that, it's not. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us clear cut that the, the entire dunya is a test. He has beautified for us women, children. And then he says, that mountains and mountain full of gold and silver and and horses with fine marking the one that would have like a uh, white colored uh, marking on their foreheads and livestock and uh, farmland all of that is what is this this is just mata'ul hayat dunya this is just the enjoyment of this life and then the the real life is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's mentioning what is on the exam. He's mentioning what's on the test. Now, if, if a person does not realize this and they're going through life, it will be very hard for them to save themselves. In another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he mentions that dunya hulwatun khadira, that the dunya is green and it's very sweet. It's green and very sweet. The Prophet ﷺ tells us two things. That in this, there is the sight a person sees. The good attractions a person sees. When we're speaking about interaction, there's many times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he knows what is the mistrust of the eyes and وَمَا تُخْفِ sudur and what is hidden in the hearts. Families, cousins, aunts, uncles, People are coming together and what? Oh, she's just like my sister. Oh, he's just like my brother. Oh, he's just only my relative. And, you know, they're hugging and kissing and they're holding hands. This is not allowed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ He knows the mistrust of the eyes. You may think that your sunglasses are hiding where you're looking, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. You may think that you're lying to yourself and saying to yourself, Oh, I don't need to look at this and this is not going to affect me and... That I'm, I'm older than this. Then what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is hidden in the hearts. This is, this is the reality. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said the dunya is something greenery. We like to see it. We like to experience seeing it. And he says it is sweet. When we taste it, it feels good. We experience things in this dunya. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will put us in this dunya. To see what are we going to do. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he says this, dunya nisa. He mentioned two things. Beware of the dunya, beware of this world, and then right after that, dunya includes everything, right? Dunya has everything. But then he says, then fattaqun nisa. From the dunya, the highest and the biggest obstacle is, watch out for the women. So why is the Prophet ﷺ saying this if we're going to assume that, no, I'm not, I'm okay with going in a gathering in a place where there's mixing happening, it's not going to affect me. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is our spiritual doctor. He is our ruhani doctor. He knows what is wrong with the nafs. And he's saying that watch out for the women. Now, how much does a person have to lie and be in this uh, uh, deception that they're thinking that no, no, there's no issues with this. Why make it an issue? And this has to be understood again in a holistic, complete manner. And then he continues and he says, فَإِنَّ أَوَلَ فِتْنَةٍ فِتْنَةِ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ كَانَتْ فِي النِّسَاءِ The first of the fitnas of Bani Israel and the people of uh, Bani Israel were from the women. The next passage, it has to do with the, the last hadith that we mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that the first fitna was the fitna of women in Bani Israel. What was that? It mentions that there was there was a person, and what he would do is they or a group of individuals they would actually start mixing with the women, and they would go and mix and they would actually commit uh, sin, and from that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He mentions that He brought them in a, such a way that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. That if we wanted, if we wished, then we would have raised them up by them. But they went towards the world and their desires. And then he says, And they followed their uh, desires. Their example is the example of a dog. How is that? That if you chase it away, it puts out his tongue and it's panting. And if, it le- if you leave it alone, it puts out his tongue again and it's panting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about this incident. The books of Tafsir mention a few things. And I wanted to actually we go over that. That's these verses, they were revealed for those individuals. What they would do is from Bani Israel, they would actually mix with the women. They would go in the sufuf of Nisa and they committed evil actions. And a person, they mix with them, the men would mix with the women and they would laugh with them and they would joke with them. And what would happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made this their first uh, uh, fitna. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa after mentioning this, he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, أَخْبَرَ أَنَّ الْمَرْأَةَ إِذَا أَقْبَلَتْ أَقْبَلَتْ فِي سُورَةَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَإِذَا أَدْبَرَتْ كَذَلِكَ He says that when the woman, when she is coming, she's walking towards a man, then shaitan comes and he does his waswasas. He wants to make that person speak to them, not only speak, but look at them, interact with them. And when she leaves, أَدْبَرَتْ When she's leaving, كذلك, then shaitan also comes to the person and says, look, what are you missing out on? Look and speak. This is what the Prophet ﷺ is speaking about, the fitnas of genders. This is the interaction that we have to understand, how important it is that we understand the right way. Inshallah, we'll end off with um, just a quick summary that the interaction that a person has, it must be in the line of what is mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah of Rasulullah ﷺ. The intermixing between the genders, this is something that Again, there is those things that are permissible. There are those things that are impermissible. We have to save ourselves from the impermissible things. We cannot be on one extreme where we don't understand this topic. And what happens is, like I mentioned, somebody's coming down the hall and a person's just ducking cover, you know, acting as if there's Godzilla coming towards them. The other end is there is no care about what this issue is. And all the person is doing is mixing, talking, joking, spending time with the opposite gender. And shaitan is their best friend and they're doing things that are not permissible. So we live in a society that has many uh, uh, avenues of intermixing. That's why it's very important that we must remember what is the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah. Inshallah, next week we'll be going over those verses that I mentioned and going into a deeper understanding of what those verses are. And again, um, this tafsir is every Thursday night for about 30, 45 minutes. And... For the next four weeks, inshallah, or the next three weeks, we'll be mentioning the topics of the verses that have to do with gender interactions. Next week, we'll be, again, uh, talking about gender uh, mixing and then the roles of the genders. 
and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained that in the Quran. We make dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to bring this into our lives and allow us to understand this. Wa akhru da'wan and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Yes. If Suleyman al-Salam is a prophet and the same Suleyman al-Salam is the father of Allah. So uh, the question was the Shu'aib that's mentioned in the story of Musa is that the Prophet or is that somebody else? So both of the tafsirs are mentioned. One narration mentions that this was uh, another person that was not the Prophet Shu'aib, but somebody that was a pious individual. And that is the accepted tafsir of these uh, verses, that this was a pious individual. He had daughters and then he was an old man and Musa is Yeah, the, then there's another Shu'aib that was a prophet, and that was the same area and the same city. If anybody has any questions, they can ask. Anybody online also, they can ask. Yes. 